Okay, we can go ahead and get started with our uh, featured EOL seminar this month for the month of May. We have Phil Chilson from the, well, he's uh, on sabbatical here, of course, at EOL with support from EOL and uh, the ASP program. Uh, his fifth background, Phil uh, received his bachelor's from Clemson University and then followed that with a Fulbright scholarship to uh, Germany, nuclear research facility in Germany. His doctorate was from Clemson University and that was when he looked like he first got started in the radar, atmospheric radar work. So after following his doctorate, uh, he had a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute and a research scientist position at the Swedish Institute for Space Physics. From there, he returned back stateside to the NOAA ETL, Environmental Technology Laboratory, which is now the Earth Systems Research Laboratory here in Boulder. In 2005, he joined the University of Oklahoma at Norman, where he's been since then, with the course of the exception of the sabbatical here at EOL. So thank you. Please introduce. Yeah. Please welcome. So. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's um, truly my pleasure to, to be here. This is <clears throat> kind of like my swan song because I'm here for the remainder of this month and then my sabbatical here comes to an end and I'll continue my sabbatical in Switzerland until the school starts in the fall. So this is um, results that um, came out of an experiment that we conducted out at the Boulder Atmospheric Observatory, which I'll, I'll get into. But um, so this is, represents one small aspect, one small part of what I've been doing here while I'm in um, Boulder. So the title, Detection of Bragg Scatter Using S-Band Polarimetric Weather Radar, Theoretical and Experimental Considerations. I put that title together, sent it out, and I thought to myself, wow, that really sounds boring. I mean, th I think this topic is way more cool than what we have here. So I, I'm going to submit to you a revised topic. So it really is, um, I think, quite a nice aspect of S-band weather radars that we can use it for looking for actually clear air. A lot of people think about clear air scatters being, you know, the monitoring of insects or dust or what have you from the atmosphere. But we're going to show, you know, you know, true clear air um, scatters in the terms of Bragg. Now, let's see what the outline is going to be about. Well, first, give a little bit of an overview of um, the theory. It's going to be very basic, you know, because I don't have time to go into the full detail. Bragg scatter can get very um, messy at some points, but so we're just going to keep it light, kind of, kind of give you an idea of what the magnitudes of the scatter are. Um, show examples of earlier Bragg scatter measurements at S band. No, we're not the first ones to have done this. Um, why do we even care about making the S-band measurements of clear air? Well, we'll talk about that some in addition. i talk about this experiment, latte. You're thinking to yourselves, what latte? Well, I'm going to tell you about it in just a bit. Um, show some results and then summarize. Now, start with the background. This is the pretty basic, you know, pretty, pretty much anybody who has any um, encounter with radar is going to have come across the radar equation. Of course, the assumptions are that you're having um, volume filling, kind of uniformly distributed scatterers. For those who like to read lists of all the variables, they're listed here. But you know, the, the interesting thing is that um, under the assumption that you do have uniformly distributed scatterers, then pretty much everything is known except for eta. But you've if you can measure the, the backscatter power, then you can get eta. So eta is the rate of reflectivity, and typically one talks about it in terms of um, point scatterers. And if you do that, then this eta is the summation over unit volume of the collective um, backscattering cross section. So it has a um, dimensions of like units of length squared per length cubed, so it's inverse length. So in, or some people like to talk about it as being, you know, like centimeter squared per cubic meter or what have you. So that's that's the basic, you know, the radar equation. So let's look further. So for weather radars, which we're kind of um, addressing with this presentation, you typically make the assumption that you have Rayleigh scatter. And that adds a whole another level of um, 
assumptions and caveats, provisos onto it, but one is that you're under the general me scattering um, theory, then you assume the particles are spherical, particles are dielectric, and, and they're small enough to be, well, this, this part here is already getting into the Rayleigh scatter. So you, you're assuming that the particles are, are very small compared to the probing radar wavelength. And then you can express eta in terms of this expression, which again, probably everybody has seen. K is related to the dielectric uh, properties of the material. Um, so water, ice, um, or liquid water and ice. And then Z is the radar reflectivity factor in terms of millimeters, six to the meters cubed. And you know, the drop side distribution and the particle side distribution. So that should be all you know, pretty well known and understood to weather radar community. Bragg scatter is mostly discussed in the wind profiling community. So although we're not talking about a collection of point scatterers within a unit volume, we can still talk about the radar reflectivity, but now it's a continuum. And so here, as opposed to scattering off of individual um, scatterers, we're looking for gradients in the refractive index to cause some of the backscatter signal to come back to the um, radar. So it is a function of the radar wavelength. Um, this term here which is an actual um, theoretical value. It's not some empirical term. And this <clears throat> value on the far right is the C sub n squared, which is the structure function parameter of the refractive index. <clears throat> and it has units of uh, meters to the minus two thirds. So what is the structure function parameter? Well, it's, it's a measure of how turbulent the atmosphere is. And so if you think about the re refractive index at two different points, and then if you sample the refractive index and then do an ensemble average, um, you're going to get some delta n squared term. Now, if you are able to make these assumptions, you're within the inertial subrange, which I'll talk about in a bit, and the, the turbulence is isotropic homogeneous and is occurring at spatial scales equivalent to the radar, one half the radar wavelength, which is the Bragg wavelength, uh, then you can say all this structure in the atmosphere can be boiled down to C sub n squared and then the separation distance r to the two-thirds. All right. So from here, we can look at the inertial subrange. So basically, you, you, know, you have your, your turbulent scales and the energy um, per unit wavelength you know, per, that is projected here on the log scale. And this is the, um, where the energy is input into the atmosphere. This is the production term. And then you have dissipation of the energy and it's, it's energy cascade. It goes from large scale to smaller scale to smaller scales. And at some point it starts dissipating by viscosity. So in this range where you are in this cascade region, that's what we're going to refer to as the inertial subrange. And <clears throat> if you have a radar, so if the radar is Bragg matched to the scales of the um, turbulent eddy, for example, if you have a, a 10 centimeter wavelength radar, then you're sensitive to turbulent eddies on the order of you know, five centimeters. So you pick your radar probing wave number and then you can project that onto this scale and then figure out about how much energy you might expect in this subrange. Now, you know, as you go, as you start going to smaller wavelengths, larger wave numbers, then you're starting to get less and less of this backscattered energy. At some point, you're going to get to this place where the energy starts falling off precipitously. So you, ideally, you'd like to be between these lines to kind of keep everything well structured. And this is indeed going to be the case right at the cusp of you know, being at that elbow point with the S-band radar. So let's look at about how strong radar reflectivity is for Bragg scatter compared to Rayleigh. And so if you look at S-pole, S-pole is going to be at um, 10 centimeters, so it's S-band radar. So for even moderate values of Z and dBZ, you're going to be overwhelmingly stronger than what you might expect from this clear air turbulence. So to give you an idea, um, 
c sub n squared of one times 10 to the minus 13 is already you know, a pretty strong value, what you might expect in the convective boundary layer. 10 to the minus 17 could be what you might expect in just the, the, the free troposphere. And then 10 to the minus 15 would be somewhere in between. So by comparison, if you have a wind profiling radar, you know, it's designed to be more sensitive to this type of scatter. So um, you can see that you don't, well, this, this signals here compared to say what you might expect from precipitation is um, even greater from, from the Bragg scatter. And then just to cast it in another, another light, here we have ranges of values of, of C sub n squared, which are considered typical. When I say typical, I mean over the wide atmosphere. So when you start going into the boundary layer convective, then large and very large values become a bit more, more typical. So you, you can actually have values of 10 to the minus 12 of C sub n squared at the top of the convective boundary layer. That's, that's, not, that's not unreasonable. Um, and these you can have in, the, in a well-mixed convective boundary layer. But these might be more typical values in the free troposphere. So what I've shown here is what the corresponding value, okay, when you, when you have the weather radar and it's, it's observing the atmosphere, it's going to make the calculations and try to express everything in terms of DBZ. But of course it's not DBZ because that's assuming that it's Rayleigh. So what would be the equivalent value of C sub n squared? Well, if you have um, S pole, 10 centimeter wavelength, if you were to have, say, a value of um, 10 to the minus 15, you're looking down here at what? Minus 38 dBz. That's, 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 not, that's not very hefty. But for the corresponding value for the um, 449, then you're looking at a value of about you know, minus 2, minus 3 dBz, if you were to translate that. So you can see that the 449 is going to be a lot more sensitive to this level of turbulence than, say, the, the S band. And then C band, this, this plot's not really quite fair because this is assuming that um, C band's even in the inertial subrange. So that actually, this value would probably get shifted even higher because you're in that region where it drops off more precipitously. So, bottom line is that you know, for weather radars, you're up against the odds already trying to look for Bragg scatter with these wavelengths. But, you know, as my, um, as my PhD professor used to tell me, if it wasn't if, it, if it's not hard, then you know, he doesn't want to be messing with it. So this gives us a, a bit of a challenge. So earlier observations. So already back in 1969, so I, I told you this is not this is not new. They have um, measurements of Bragg scatter from S band using um, you know its Wallop Island facility. So it has a, a long history. Uh, this is a paper that came out, actually from Scott, his co-author on this paper from um, Eaton et al. So this was using an FMCW um, S-band radar. Uh, this was um, White Sands um, facility. And so this had a really phenomenal range resolution. So you can kind of see all this structure, all this is Bragg scatter. So this is Bragg scatter observed with an S-band radar. Of course, it's not, you know, the range, is, this is when it sits on the ground and looks vertically. Um, you start picking up little insects and you see all this, you know, beautiful structure. And that's kind of what you'd like to get at in order to do observations of the, the boundary layer. And they've actually had this a similar radar um, out at the BAO, but I have plots which I'm not going to show. So now let's look at S band weather radar looking at Bragg scatter. And there's this, these are um, results from a paper by. Uh, Melnikov in 2011. We're getting progressively, we're kind of moving forward in time. And he shows, using an S-band radar, that you can detect these Bragg echoes. And what you definitely want to pay attention to is that, firstly, you have an enhancement of the power. The, um, this is an SNR, so you don't see the corresponding DBZ values, but they're quite small. You typically see uh, very values of ZDR, that are close to zero because you know, it doesn't really have much of an aspect sensitivity. And um, rho HV, the correlation coefficients, are typically close to one because the signals are highly correlated. And so with this paper, we went 
and did some additional measurements. And um, this is going to be from, it says Jacobson 2014. You're not going to find that in the literature yet. We're writing a paper on it. But this is, is from my graduate student's MS thesis. So if you're curious to learn more about the measurements we did there, you can ask me for that. Um, so this is, a, you know, again, same deal. You have this enhanced echo coming from a radar that's doing uh, range height indicator RHI scans. And you can see the sounding. So there's, it's definitely detecting the top of the boundary layer based on the sounding that was um, released not far from this radar location. Now, power is not necessarily the, the best way for picking out these signals. If you start looking at, this is for a different day. I'm sorry about that. But this is for June 9th. If you look at correlation coefficients and ZDR, then you start seeing very distinctly how this, this top of the boundary layer structure is going to jump out at you. Um, so, you know, this, you're looking at power is good, but I think a lot of times looking for signals in um, ZDR and, and rho HV actually show these structures better. Now, you think about it, you got, you know, from the radar out to 45 kilometers, you're actually measuring the top of the boundary layer, the depth of the boundary layer. And this is just for one scan. Yes? Yeah, it probably does. If, I say close to zero. I don't, he, he, he has some histograms, and it's not exactly um, zero. It's, it's the same for the data which I'm going to be showing. It's not ex exactly zero. And um, so that's something we got to think about some more. OK, so why should this matter in the first place? Well, if you look at you know like just a characteristic textbook sketch of the boundary layer depth, now you'll see that you know for the um, theta central temperature, the um, wind speed, you know the uh, Q, uh, specific humidity, and we even show any particulates in biota. Biota being maybe insects in this case, you'll see these sharp gradients. So you do you do expect to see Bragg scatter at the top of the boundary layer. So that's that's kind of what we're detecting here. We're looking we're detecting this um, the sharp gradient at the top of the atmospheric boundary layer. So that gives you a way of monitoring the depth and development of the boundary layer. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Yes? We don't know that. Actually, there were quite a few insects. And if, if we were to show this as just Z, it would be not so obvious. But um, you, the, the insects were, would have a, a different rho HV and ZDR um, signature than the top, top of the boundary layer. Yes? So I, I'm sorry, I, I should be repeating questions because um, the correlation coefficient is estimated over what time period? Um, for it's on on the order of uh, on the order of um, it's less than a minute. Yes. So you know, as we know from wind profilers, you can use. Um, radars for looking for the development of the boundary layer. Except with the wind profilers, you know, you sit, you look up and have a soda straw view of the atmosphere, and you're, you know, let's sit either advect over you, or in the case of a convective boundary layer, it might develop above you. Um, so that's why this is giving as a function of time. You know, but if you have a weather radar, then you can also look for the development of the boundary layer. And you can even look for, in addition to, you know, pure solar drivers, you might have um, looking for other perturbation effects. You know, for example, like urban heat islands. You, if you have you scan over a metropolitan area, are you going to see an increase in the boundary layer depth based on this effect? I would imagine you would, but we don't have any data to show that yet. So that would be another um, benefit of looking at these data. And you can, it's not all about the boundary layer. You know, you, st you can also get upper level turbulent layers, as we're going to, uh, as, as I'll kind of show you in the, up in the forthcoming slides, where you, you'll have these um, either, you know, mountain-generated um, turbulence and, or, you know, something else is, is, is moisture layer, humid layer, 
which the radar should be able to pick up is Bragg scatter. So, some of the key assumptions Okay, the question was how good of an assumption is that the turbulence is isotropic. Um, it doesn't need to be necessarily isotropic over the entire sampling volume. It has to be isotropic at the scale at which the turbulence exists. So in this case, if you have a 10 centimeter wavelength, you're assuming that turbulence eddies that are on the order of five centimeters are going to be roughly isotropic. But it doesn't mean that you, know, you couldn't have embedded into some other layers which are not necessarily isotropic. OK, so this brings us to this overview of the latte. And um, I will talk more about this. This is just more of the eye candy to kind of show some of the instruments. And this is not what I'm going to give you during this presentation is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, because you know, it's, it, this was what we're going to talk about with just one aspect of a larger experiment. It was done out at the um, Boulder Atmospheric Observatory um, Tower, operated by NOAA. And you know, these are the radars that we'll be discussing. And I just threw that one out, just to show two LIDARs having fun out in the field. Um, if you're like me, you see an acronym, and you think, gosh darn, what was that thing all about? Don't worry about it. Just remember thermodynamics and turbulence. So that's the, that was the main driver behind this. So in brief, um, this was a multi-institutional and multi-sensor atmospheric boundary layer experiment. And I really don't have time to go into it all. The, most of it was taking place on February 10th through 28th, but it just continued to go on and on and on. And we finally pulled out the last LIDARs just into last month. So we have a, um, a huge data set. And I'm, I'm really excited about you know, digging into it. These were the primary objectives. But we really are only going to focus on this bullet point here for this presentation. And so was detect feasibility of detecting Bragg scatter using NCARS S fall weather radar in Colorado and in winter. So this was supposed to be kind of the high risk um, component of the experiment, from what everybody told me. I, I was I was thinking we would we, we would have a relatively easy time getting the Bragg scatter, but I was told this was going to be the high risk component of it. And so I thought, okay, well if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, then we'll move on and we have plenty of other good data to look at. All right, results. Now we need to get ourselves all oriented. OK, this is, of course, the S-Pole. It's um, located at this location. Well, redundant. It's situated at this location up at um, Firestone. And for orientation, this is Erie, Interstate 25. And this is the actual tower, this little um, marker here. And then slightly behind the tower with respect to S-Pole is where the 449 megahertz wind profiler is going to be located, or it was located. And this is a picture of the 449, picture of the S-Pole, and that's probably enough of that. So this is the concept. We're going to have a, a field of some kind of atmospheric structure, which is not necessarily clouds or um, precipitation. It's just gradients in the refractive index. We're going to have S-Pole over here doing an RHI scan over the location of the 449. And the 449 is just going to be doing this soda straw view looking vertically. And the S-Pole radar is going to be doing RHIs over the site. But the nice thing is that and I, I really am thankful for Tammy for convincing me to, to do slices not over, only over the, um, the BAO, but also other places at other azimuth angles, because it really gives us an idea of how much variability there is in the um, boundary layer structures and also the upper level layers when we were doing this experiment. But for the most part, the focus here is going to be over the BAO site. Um, yeah, so I guess that's enough of that. And also, just to give yourself a bit more orientation, is that this is the 449. This is the tower. 
We have 580 meter separation between the two, and S pole is in this direction. This is going to be important because we're going to be getting clutter from this tower, not surprisingly, but our wind profile is going to be slightly behind the clutter, as we'll, we'll be seeing. So now, let's ask ourselves the question, can we detect Bragg scatter using S-band in Colorado in wintertime? And hopefully the answer is yes, because otherwise this whole presentation is just a big <laughs> failure. And I've, I've brought you here under false pretenses, and it's been a ruse. But another question we can ask ourselves is why uh, make measurements in winter in the first place? Well, um, it was partly logistical because of the availability of the 449, but also we wanted to mitigate the effects of having any scatter from insects. Because, you know, you're always going to be people saying, what if they're insects? Well, it was in February. Come on. Um, so we can, in my mind, we can pretty much rule out the um, insects. But we have other things we need to consider. I'm not going to go over all of this. If you are radar savvy, then your eyes are going to start, do -do 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 -do, um, start going over this and looking at the different components that are of interest to you. If you're not, then let me just say that this was a very specialized scanning strategy which was intended to increase the detectability of weak echoes. And so this, this is not your typical weather radar scan that you have when you're looking for precip. You know, this was like oh, um, doing RHI scans at about, I think it was one degree per second. Uh, um, and we're doing a lot of oversampling. We're doing a lot of um, clutter filtering um, reductions and such. So this, this was kind of motivated by some of the findings in this paper by Melnikov and also from my communications with him. OK, so testing of the radar setups. This, this scan was being tested on the 13th. It wasn't even a part, officially part of the experiment. Um, Tammy was running the radar from her office, which was kind of a cool thing to be able to do. And um, started getting these images. I thought, wow, that's, that looks pretty cool. So let me give you some orientation. This line right here is the range from S pole to out to the location of the wind profiler. So remember I told you the wind profiler was slightly behind the tower? Well, this is the clutter from the tower. So we're just, just behind that. We also did some cuts to either side of the tower. And then, as I mentioned, also some in other um, azimuths as well. This one, um, I, had, I started thinking about this when I was preparing this presentation, trying to think what it would could be, but then I, I'm thinking this is actually the clutter from I-25 because it's right at the location where I-25 is with respect to S pole. And if you, this is kind of an odd projection, but if you do this as a, you know, where the axes are similar, then you see a nice, you know, arcing pattern from, from the from the side lobes of the radar. So maybe maybe the S pole people will tell me that I'm wrong on this, but I, I'm pretty sure that's clutter from I-25. And then I would say this is Bragg scatter. Now at this point, what you should be thinking to yourself is, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where's the evidence? How are you going to tell me this Bragg scatter? First, you show us an, an image with some enhanced echoes. You got this voodoo magic going on with your radar scan, and now you're going to say this is Bragg scatter. If you're saying that, then that's the right thing. Well, let's look at some additional pieces to the puzzle here. We have. Um, I did some additional filtering. And these filtering levels were, oops, quasi arbitrary. But I decided just to go ahead and limit um, <coughs> values of z less than minus 30 dBz. And I threw out any um, ZDR values greater than 2 and less than minus 2. Again, we can discuss whether or not these levels are good. Or not. I can change them. These are just the first slice. And then I just went ahead and kicked out everything that had a correlation coefficient less than 0 0.5. And so this does suggest that we're getting coherent echoes, kind of lowish ZDR values while we have these layers. So can I now say that it's Bragg scatter? Well, you should still be suspicious, because what if it's a cloud? But luckily, the BAO tower is outfitted with cameras um, looking in five different directions. This is the S pole. One of the cameras is looking directly over S pole, just by dumb luck. And then the other ones are looking at other directions. So this is the one 
for the time when I showed that RHI cut, um, that's the image. Not a, I mean, there's some haze, but there's, there are no clouds looking directly at, towards S pole. Looking at this direction, no, no clouds. Here we start seeing a little bit of cloud. Um, and I got to remind you, you're looking at the clouds from the radar. So if you want to think about this in terms of how the clouds are, you almost have to flip this image 180. So, you know, from, well, anyway, this cloud's kind of really right here, you know, because you're looking at it out this way. And then the same here. So this is actually kind of a blank spot in the sky again. No clouds except for maybe behind the mountains. And there are some clouds out, but we're not looking in that direction. So we're, we're looking at data along this, this cut. That's why these two images are kind of critical. And these uh, photos were taken at about 1833, which is approximately the time of the RHI. So camera shows clear skies from the tower. So even if there are some clouds behind the tower, it was pretty much clear from here out to there. So that stuff seems to be clear air echoes. What happens the other side of it looks very similar to what's happening this side. So I would contend that we're not seeing clouds. Plus, we have a coelometer. I'm just going to keep piling on evidence so, so nobody can walk out of this room saying, Phil, you're full of nonsense, and this is not Bragg scatter. So the coelometer was operating right beside the 449. We're looking um, up this day. So there's a few little bits of um, high level, well, mid level clouds. But this is where we were actually getting RHI from. So no clouds, no insects. Um, I thought I had one in there that showed it to be Bragg. Well, let's go on further. This is a, uh, now we're going to bring in the wind profiler. And I don't have time to go into the details between standard processing and RIM processing. RIM is range imaging. It's a way of increasing the, the, um, the range resolution of the radar. And so this is what the standard processing, this is what we're seeing in atmospheric structures for that time of day um, using range imaging. This oscillations is the range weighting function being seen. Again, I, I'm not going to go into the to the rim, that would be a whole different um, presentation, but I'm mostly going to be focusing on, um, on these data when looking for comparisons with S pole. All right, so this is the um, location of the 449 with respect to S pole. This line is going to be the time of the RHI with respect to the 449. Now, to me, this is probably the most cool picture of the entire presentation. Um, once you accept the fact that we're looking at Bragg scatter. Because, I mean, you have a image of the atmosphere looking aloft with a high time resolution of 30 seconds as the atmosphere is kind of being evicted past the radar. And then for this slice, we have a two-dimensional cut of what the atmosphere is like. So you, it's almost like you're saying, um, like in the you know, Star Trek holodeck, you touch that button, give me a full expansion, and this, you know, you get this. This is what the atmosphere was doing over a larger extent for that given time. Now, the downside, of course, to RHIs is you don't have them at such a high temporal resolution. But when you start stitching these two data pieces together, and you can build together really cool um, images of what the atmosphere is doing aloft. And then I'm going to just show you that for this range and this height, you know, it does correspond well with this layer that we're seeing with the 449. So we, might, we have enough data to try to determine whether we see the location that is on this company. Okay, the question was, can we see these features propagate? And I'm going to show some sequential images from S-Pole in just a little bit, which may be five or six images, um, which show them propagating in time. So, so no, one, one yes. How can I claim that both Bragg scatter? Yeah, I mean, why couldn't you, you, you scatter or wave scatter or anything? Well, the next, well, okay, if there's not a cloud in the sky, 
So I don't know how I could be getting Rayleigh scatter. And if it's me, I, this seems also highly unlikely. But the next step is going to be to calibrate the two radars in precip, which I have data for that. And then we'll see if they give similar um, backscattered power. So that's, that's the next definitive step. Yes, Jim. Okay, so Jim, Jim was just mentioning that you can see the this layer at four kilometers quite often at the site because of you know waves being advected over the the crest of the mountains. And I agree with you, there were westerly um, flows, and that's almost definitely what this what the cause of this is this um, being energy being injected through this turbulent layer, which is cascading down to scales which can be detected by the by the S pole and for the 449. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, so we, we'll see these um, orographic features now. How can we use something besides just the wind profile to really study their two-dimensional structure? And that's what I'm you know, kind of excited about with using the um, S-pole. Okay, so now I'm going to say Bragg scatter, and I'm going to go ahead and say yes. Now, there could still be some um, doubts in the room, but I'm going to go forward with the assumption that this is actually Bragg scatter. In case you're interested, I just grabbed the uh, surface conditions. So you might want to know what the humidity levels were like at the surface. I don't know what they were like aloft, um, but this is kind of the humidity levels and temperatures. So we were measuring at about this point. So it's about 10 degrees Celsius at the surface, and RH is about you know just under 40 degree um, percent. Okay, so here's this. I'm going to show some. A sequence of uh, times uh, RHIs that were collected over the BAO site. So this is 1825. And remember, in the 449, we saw that layer that was descending in time. So this is indeed that layer descending in time. Now it's going to be hard. It's hard for me to get my mind around all these images and you know, kind of pull together a, a nice image of what the atmosphere is doing, but at this point, I'm just trying to establish this as a measurement technique and then kind of go back and then um, look at some of these dynamic structures in more detail after this presentation. But you can see it evolving in time. So you can, the time is on the top. So a lot of dynamic features that can be observed. Now, again, what I'm saying we have here is a two-dimensional structure as opposed to just a soda straw view, which we've always had in the past with the um, 449s or other wind profiling radars. All right. So that was, that was just during the testing. That was just, you know, Tammy playing around with the radar to making sure if the scanning strategy was going to work. And we got all this. So we got excited. The next day, we went out and um, did a, a longer uh, period of measurements, launched four radio soundings. And I'm not going to show this day but for interest of time because there was a mixture of clear sky and clouds. So it gets kind of confusing. So we have these data to look at. Um, so I'm excited to do that. But I'm going to hold off and show you another case from a really clear day. But before I do that, I just have to show this image just because I think it's cool. Um, this is the 449 using this conventional um, radar um, signal processing. And so we're, you get a lot of radio frequency interference at the, um, at the BAO site. But we were actually transmitting at four different frequencies. And so oftentimes you might only get the RFI at one particular frequency. So this was um, taking all the signals, averaging together. And you can see you've got kind of a coarse view of this. This is the, this is the actual track of the radio sound, sound as it goes up. So it's actually being seen by the 449 off in the, into the side lobes. If you do the range imaging, you get a much, much, much cleaner indication of where that sounding, that radio sound was. And because of your diff different frequencies, um, you can actually defeat some of this RFI 
this surprised me, and I'm still need to get my head around this, because I wasn't expecting to see a cleaner image and see the RFI mitigated. So that's kind of a work in progress. So this was a case when we do have completely clear skies. We launched one radio sounding. Um, we were out flying our UAV, which I only mention that because I can tell you we were out by the tower for a long period of time looking at the sky, and I can tell you it was clear. It wasn't just a few you know, camera shots from the tower. Um, this is a typical view, you know, clear. I mean, and this was the, the temperature and relative humidity from the tower, uh, from, the, from, the, from the sand, and then that shows the trajectory. So now we look at another RHI scan for the 26th. Now we don't see so much of these upper level structures, but now we see a lot of action down here at lower level. So here we're looking at um, what I would contend to be boundary layer structures. Again, same deal, you know, I-25, interference in the tower, and that's the location of the 449. And do the similar scanning, so you do see that this holds up to the fact of having a low ZDR, highly correlated signals, and no clouds. So we're probably getting rag scatter from the top of the boundary layer. But is it really corresponding to the, the top of the boundary layer? Well, I, I guess I'll show you the sounding next. This is a comparison between the RHI, what was observed with the um, 449. And so it's kind of hard to see. It gets kind of messy in here, but there is, at this point, a layer, an enhanced value of um, Z right at this point, right about where you have that layer being detected by the 449. And then this stuff up here corresponds to what we're being seen by the 449. And then you got this layer up here. Now, you, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't see anything on this image. Well, if you go back and start looking at this um, correlation coefficients and ZDR, there is a very faint indication that we're seeing an upper level layer with the S-pole. So I would say this is actually a faint uh, layer that's being, being detected by the S-pole. Okay, so this sounding was launched right at the, B, at the uh, 449 site. So you see this um, in relative humidity, this um, kind of a shifting of the relative humidity, which is indicative of the top of the boundary layer. On this scale, you don't see it so much, but there is a, a kink in the temperature profile, also indicative of the top of the boundary layer. So I would say this is actually the, the boundary layer depth that we're being able to detect. Now, if, you might be wondering, why aren't we seeing any of this stuff up here on this image? Well, because for this time of this RHI, the balloon is only going up at this height. And then if you look at this trajectory, it's actually, you know, it's getting hit by westerly winds and it's flying out over this way. So at some point it's going to be not, this cut's not going to be very useful, but we need to look at one that goes at 180, so it looks uh, more south. So we got the RHI scan for 2124. It's looking 180 directly um, south. This was the height of the balloon at the time of this scan. So at that point, it's about 193 degrees azimuth with respect to the um, S-pole. So now we can see that this, these structures are actually being kind of seen as a hint of an um, echo here. OK, so we're really close to the end. This is just for your viewing pleasure, the surface conditions on that day, so you can kind of see what the relative humidities were and the temperatures um, on that particular day. So I'm going to zoom in now just for the sake of um, looking at this boundary layer. This is what we're actually seeing. Um, so now the, it's the same RHI cut, except I'm only going up to 2.5 kilometers. So we're seeing a the top of the boundary layer here at least out to 20 kilometers. Um, in winter time, in Colorado, you know, dry air, all that. So, uh, really cool structures that are being uh, seen here. So, you know, the next thing is to really go into these, these data and start sussing out 
what that atmospheric boundary layer structure means. You know, why, what are these perturbations? Are they consistent across different um, slices and what have you? Um, this was the same thing after you're doing filtering. You know, so you can see these, these, um, these structures which correspond to you know, the top of this boundary layer. Which brings me to my conclusions. So we were able to detect, in my opinion, Bragg scatter with the S pole in Colorado in winter. Um, we operated the S pole in a special mode, which was a help facilitate detection of these weak echoes. You know, you don't see this when the next rads are running in their conventional, even clear air mode, or probably not typical. You would need really strong uh, Bragg scatter in order to be picked up in a S mixed rad um, clear air mode. So we have, I do have data which is from joint measurements of S pole and 449 during precipitation. So then we know it's Rayleigh scatter, and we know how that backscatter signal should um, correlate, and we can use that to calibrate 449 because we don't have an absolute calibration standard. And then once we get it calibrated, then we can go back and then compare the um, C sub n squared signals and apply the right formulation and see if the, these two um, curves match. Okay, we have, to my mind, a really nice opportunity looking for boundary layers and upper level scattering layers. And this is a lot of data. I'm just showing you, you know, just a small sampling of it. There's still a lot more work to be done. Some questions. We need, still need to consider what we, how we can discriminate between Bragg scatter and clouds because we've now upped the sensitivity of the radar so we can actually see the clouds. Uh, but how we discriminate between the Bragg from the clear air and the Rayleigh from the clouds. So that's something we need to dig into more. How prevalent are these upper level scattering layers? Well, we've heard you know, uh, that in orographic locations, you know, with, with, with orographic perturbations, you can often see these upper level scattering layers generated by flows over mountains. Um, can we even further improve the signal processing in order to make these signals even more detectable? All right. So a lot of people were involved. So I really am extremely grateful to the NCAR folks who made a lot of contributions to this. Um, of course, you know the people. Uh, this really wouldn't have happened without them. And I know I've already said this many times, but this is really just one component of the bigger latte data set. So that hopefully we'll be getting a lot of good data and good analysis and papers out of this experiment. And so and I'm going to give you a third, a third title. So kind of detection of Bragg scattering using S-band polarimetric weather radar a detective story because there's still a lot of work to be done to kind of figure out the best way to utilize um, these data. But just if I see this, this kind of image, I get kind of excited to think about being able to use that for um, boundary layer studies using a radar that's capable of looking at two-dimensional slices and not just you know, looking at that, you know, the soda straw view. So with that, I'll stop. I'm, wow, I'm right on time. And I will take any questions you might have. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Phil. And uh, for any questions, please grab the mic so we can be pick it up by the, uh, on the webcast. <laughs> so um, I really like your four and a half kilometer. And to me, that looked like mountain waves, possibly. Um, and uh, you can see the Bragg scatter. I'll, I'll take that argument. I'm not a specialist. But if indeed that's what you're seeing, um, can you also see that in Doppler velocity? Yes. And therefore, you have the stratification. So can you come up with Bronn-Weisler frequency and see that your waves up and down actually match what you would expect? Yes, I think that's the beauty with cost. A lot of times with using the profilers, you're making these assumptions about um, wavelengths, and you don't know because if it's a true wavelength, it's being advected across, you know, the wind profiler. So you know, you really can't d definitively back out what the wavelengths are. But with this, you can actually see the wavelengths captured in one snapshot. And like you, there are um, Doppler velocity. If you're just using a pure weather radar then I'm not quite sure how useful they would be, but if it's in conjunction with a vertically pointing wind profiler, which is designed to 
to get three-dimensional winds. And I didn't show any of the winds, but we have winds for all the cases that we have. Plus, we have you know, winds from the, the, we had four LIDARs operating at the site, uh, Doppler LIDARs, and then um, five radio soundings that were launched. So it would, I, I agree that something of that variety would be a, one of the many things that we can do with these data. So my comment is more of a comment than a question. It continues on what Jan said. Um, it's, as a true observationalist, I noticed in one of your photos there was a fern wall um, on, the, on the Rocky Mountains, so, which is a good indication that there might be waves downwind. Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to point you to a T-Rex special collection. Uh, we detected cases of elevated shear layers. Um, right there at the ridge height of the of the Sierra Nevada, so it could be possible that you are seeing some of these elevated shear layers that that induce yeah. turbulence. Yeah, I, I I agree completely. I think the nice thing is that the Bragg scatter gives you a tracer that allows the radar to get back scatter. Otherwise, you know you're, you got all this great structure up there, but you're kind of you know blind to it. But now, if we can tweak the radar operating parameters such that they can see that scatter then kind of start looking for those kind of structures and features and then take I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with this the T-Rex so maybe I haven't read every paper in that special issue but I will go that back will start to elevate yep to okay thank you do you have enough data from the S poll that you can convert into in, it into the sort of image we get off the wind profiler. Yes, we've. You mean okay? You want to? You, you mean can we convert the S pole data to at, something like at a, that range gate for that that at that range gate at for those heights? Are you taking the data fast enough so you could just take that one range gate out and make it look like the wind profiler <coughs> sampling and then compare it to the wind profiler? Yeah, we we um I think with this data set, it will not be easy because we were doing those other. RHI cuts, but we do have data from KOUN in Oklahoma where we were just up and down, up and down over over one um, azimuth directed over the, uh, the Kessler Atmospheric and Ecological Field Station. And there we did, as, as part of this master's thesis, which I alluded to in Jacobson 2014, you, we converted, um, we, we found the, we projected the radar onto a Cartesian coordinate um, and then found the, the point directly over the wind profiler site and then did stitch together and made a simulated um, range time intensity and then compared that with things that we have, would get get from the 404 megahertz wind profiler that we had at, the, at that site and yeah, it looks pretty nice. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so you're looking at features that are half the wavelength of the radar? Yes. But do you think that you'd be able to apply this technique to seeing some larger scale features come in, or perhaps say, um, say gravity waves moving along the inversion? Or are you yeah, the be features, able to? Yeah, as long as the smaller scale turbulent structures are embedded within the larger scale features, then you will get that scatter. You just need to have turbulence at, in this case, on a, about five centimeter wavelength scale, but it can be, you know, tracing. This larger scale um, features, if I understood your question correctly. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And so you were scanning the radar very slowly, large number of samples, large dwell time. Yes. To be able to get all this really high resolution. Mm -hmm. And did you do the sounding launches? Are they was the ascent rate of the balloons slower to get yeah, a lot we more under, data? Yeah, we we kind of somewhat underinflated the balloons. That we were getting ascent rates of like five meter per second. Um, again, I didn't show those data, just in interest of time and to kind of keep a more clear, lucid presentation. I hope it was lucid, but, um, but you know, we, we have those data in there. That those results are also pretty cool, but I, it's not so, so I'm kind of driving at, would you, could you apply this to PECON? Yes. Okay. I would say yes. I think, I think that's a nice application in an experiment coming up for this type of scan. Uh, one more question. If uh, okay, let's assume that it is it is a Bragg scatter. Um, then the ratio between the two uh, volume reflectivities should be constant. Yep. If it is not constant, so if you look at uh, at, at at the same height, 
and you look at the time series of the ratio between eta 1 and eta 2, you know, the two step, uh, this should be a constant. So if it is not a constant, then it could mean two things. Either the inner scale becomes too large, or some other uh, scattering uh, mechanism may play a role. I agree. <coughs> so if the second option is not relevant, so if it is really just turbulent scatter, then you could probably this, these dropouts or the deviations mm -hmm. from that universal ratio, you can say, okay, this is where epsilon drops between that critical value. So you could use that also as a, at least a digital energy dissipation rate measure. I, I agree, and I actually hadn't thought about it from that perspective, but yeah, you're absolutely correct, and that would be a nice application as well. If that's all of them, then let's give Phil a thank you again.